welcome to the last session of the day. We will have Abby Rogers speaking first, and then we will have myself wrap, speaking about what I do and then wrapping up the conference. I'd like to introduce Dr. Abby Rogers, co-director, Centre for Environmental Economics and Policy, the University of Western Australia. Dr. Rogers works extensively in economic an analysis of marine, coastal and other natural environments and has recently been focused on evaluating non-market impacts of natural hazards. This presentation will explore the values, intangible and economic, that can be reflected in our use of heritage buildings as tourism sites, public buildings or commercially. Over to you, Abby. Thanks, Georgia. And thanks everyone for joining me to learn about the non-market value of the heritage buildings in York in Western Australia. And so this work has been commissioned out of the Bushfire and Natural Hazards CRC. And so it will obviously be in the context of thinking about natural hazards and earthquake risks in particular. Uh, I know that for those of you who have tuned into the rest of the conference, you will have caught a glimpse of some of these sorts of issues and, and how they present in York, um, particularly with Mark Edwards' talk from Geoscience Australia. For those of you who um, missed some of that earlier content, a bit of background about York and its heritage. Um, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the long held history and heritage of the traditional owners of the York region and pay respect to the Baladong Noongar people who are the spiritual and cultural custodians of that land. But also to recognise that York is really important in terms of European history in Western Australia. It is the oldest inland settlement in WA, um, first settled there in 1831. The Shire itself has about three and a half thousand residents, give or take a couple of hundred, uh, and the majority of those, about two and a half thousand, reside in the town or near the town site. Importantly, the town is only about 100 kilometres east of the Perth city area, which makes it a really popular tourist destination because of its proximity and its rich history. Uh, and an important part of that history uh, are the heritage buildings in the area. So when we conducted this bit of research back in 2020, there were 30 buildings that were listed on the WA State Heritage Register. And that'll be part of the focus of this discussion. We also know that York is situated in one of Australia's highest seismic hazard regions. And obviously with a whole lot of old buildings, that means that those are going to be susceptible to damage from earthquake. As well as impacts on the buildings, we know that there are other impacts associated with natural hazards like earthquakes, and in particular, the local communities and visitors to the region might be impacted through um, physical and mental health uh, challenges. In particular, mental health, mental well-being is a big uh, concern after any disaster event. Uh, and also, there can be significant impacts around social disruption. So we'll often see that local communities might become disconnected and that there'll be um, extended periods of service outages from our utilities like provision of water, electricity and gas and so on. Of course, we can mitigate those risks to reduce or entirely remove the impact of earthquake on some of those things. We can retrofit buildings to withstand earthquakes better. We can upgrade infrastructure to our utilities to minimise the likelihood of an outage occurring or reduce the, the period of time. And we can put in place better response plans, particularly to try and target those impacts on people's mental wellbeing. But all of those things cost money and quite a lot of it. And we know that all three tiers of our government are struggling with how they prioritise their limited resources, their financial resources available to mitigate the risks of a whole range of different natural hazards. So they're grappling with multiple hazards across multiple locations and potentially a raft of different potential management options that they can throw at those, each of which have their own costs associated with them. And when we think about York on its own, um, there's the risk of earthquake, but also bushfire and flood. And recently we learned from Saroja that the wheat belt region in WA isn't even immune to cyclone threats. So We've got a lot of different things to try and weigh up and, and target our resources towards, which means that prioritising our investment in hazard mitigation really needs to be a focus so that we get the best value for our money. And that's where integrated economic assessments become really important because they are able to bring together 
the range of different benefits and costs of different mitigation programs or policies and work out which ones are going to give us the best bang for our buck. In order to do that well though, it's really important that we understand the full range of values. And when we think about economic values, often we move to a place of thinking about the financial or market-based values of different things. So if we take heritage buildings as an example, those market-based values might, for example, be the entry fees that are charged for people to access certain buildings. It might be the profits made through sales and leases of commercially occupied buildings. But those things are potentially not the most important elements of value when we think about something like a heritage building or other elements of our natural environment as well. Often it's the non-financial or intangible or what we refer to in economics as the non-market values that are most important. So these things refer to, in the case of heritage buildings, things like the aesthetic value. So anyone who visits York can go and walk down the street and take in the beauty of those old buildings. And that's a value to them, even though they're not making a transaction and exchanging money to be able to do that. It's, it's free to actually look at these things from the street. Still implies that people are going to York and interacting with that heritage landscape though. On the other hand, there are some even further removed values that we refer to as existence values or non-use values. And these can be really important for our, our heritage and our natural environment as well. Uh, and that's just the existence value of knowing that this heritage still stands. So there will be people in Perth who don't even make the trip out to York, but still care about the fact that, that those heritage buildings persist because of the importance to our, our history. And what's really important here is to recognise that economics is much more than just a study of financial value. Um, so we do like the marketplace because it measures things in dollars and dollars are a really useful metric because they put everything on a level playing field. They make things commensurate. We can understand that if we have to spend so much to get something, we know what that thing is worth when, when it's returned to us. So it's a, it's a useful measuring stick. And with that in mind, in economics, we don't have to exclude these environmental and social values, things like those recreational or aesthetic use values or the non-use existence values of things. We can actually use economic methods to equate these things in monetary equivalent terms. And then we can bring everything together in that integrated economic assessment, like a benefit cost analysis, and make sure that we're not ignoring these values from our prioritisation of how to invest our resources, and instead actually bring them explicitly to the decision making table and understand how we can trade them off against one another. So instead of comparing apples with oranges, we've got a whole basket full of apples. So how do we do that? We can measure people's willingness to pay through a different, a couple of different mechanisms. Uh, the first is through looking at revealed preferences. So we can examine people's behaviour. For example, how many people have actually visited York in the past year? And how often do they make a repeat visit? And how far have they had to travel from their, their home? And through that, we can work out, we can estimate their travel costs to get to York. And we know that their trip to York is worth at least as much as they've had to spend in terms of their travel cost. We can also explore property premiums. So for example, if a heritage property is sold, we can look at the uh, additional value attributed to that property because it's a heritage property. Let's say it's a hotel compared to another hotel that isn't heritage listed, but functionally is very similar and in the same area. The trouble with that sort of application to a regional town like York is that there often isn't enough volume of sales data to actually do a statistical analysis around that. The other limitation of looking at people's revealed behaviours, that it implies those people are using that particular asset in some way. So we're looking at their recreational use value or the value of a property for some other purpose to be used. And so it ignores that non-use existence value that might be attributed to some of these heritage buildings. So to get a more holistic perspective, we use stated preference approaches, which are survey-based mechanisms where we can look at how much people are hypothetically willing to pay for a change in the quality or the quantity of those non-market outcomes. 
And that's what we've done in this study. Uh, and in particular, we've used a method called a choice experiment, which I'll step you through. So to give you a more familiar example of what a choice experiment is about and how it works first, imagine that we're in a post-COVID world where we start to attend conferences again in person and you're about to leave your accommodation and head to the conference venue and you need to decide how you're actually going to get there. So to do this, you're going to have a range of options presented to you. There are different choices that you can make, um, maybe two or three different options that you're thinking about. And those options are actually defined by a set of attributes in this left column here. Those attributes might be the mode of transport that you can adopt to get to your conference venue. It might be the wait time that you experience waiting to board that transport. It might be the trip time once you actually get onto the transport. And of course, there's going to be some sort of cost associated with it. Those attributes vary in the levels that they can take across the different options that you have in front of you. So the levels of the transport mode might be train or bus. The wait time could be any number of different minutes. And the trip time might be defined by whether it's an express service that gets you directly there or a slightly more frustrating journey with lots of stops along the way. And of course, a different ticket cost for each of those different transport options. And so what you need to do, and, and people do this implicitly whenever they're making decisions at the supermarket or catching transport or whatever else it may be, you need to make a trade-off between the cost of an option and the levels of the attributes that define that option. So perhaps you're a bit indifferent about whether you get on a train or a bus, it doesn't really matter, but you don't really like waiting at the stop for too long. So an option that has a smaller wait time is more appealing. On the other hand, you get really annoyed when you're on a journey and the service is frequently stopping and people are moving around a lot. So that's not appealing. And option two happens to cost a little bit more than option one. So maybe on this occasion, you're actually going to make a trade off that, well, I don't really like waiting at the train station for 15 minutes, but I like the idea of the express service and it's a bit cheaper. So you make these trade offs between the different attribute levels that are presented in each option to you. Of course, once you get to the ticket machine, you might realise you left your wallet back at the hotel. You actually don't have any money on you. So on this morning, you're actually going to opt out of catching some transport and go back to the hotel because you can't actually afford the options. Of course, we know that those three options might not be the only ones available to you. There could be a whole range of different services that might present for you. Um, there might be different trains and different buses that you can catch. And these are going to take on different levels of the same attributes. And so there might be a whole bunch of different choices that you need to think about those trade-offs for. And so in a choice experiment, what we do is construct this type of implicit decision in an explicit way. And we present a, a number of these different questions to people. So each time they see a new choice scenario like this, there'll be a different arrangement of attribute levels that they see in each of the options. And that way we get lots of information about them. The cost will change each time and the levels of the attributes in the options change each time. So that once we get a whole lot of these choices collected from people, we can do a statistical analysis that tells us, all right, people are willing to pay X dollars um, because they prefer a bus over a train or they're willing to pay X dollars to reduce the wait time by one minute or five minutes or 10 minutes and so on. So we can unpack the components of the decisions that people are making. And so what we've done for this project is construct one of those scenarios for understanding people's preferences for mitigation strategies um, to protect uh, buildings, to reduce outages and to reduce mental health impacts in York. Um, and I'll step you back through this particular choice scenario in a minute. But first of all, to give you some more detail on the attributes that we measured willingness to pay for. The first one obviously is around these heritage buildings. And so what we have to do to set up this choice scenario is tell people what the current impacts are of earthquakes on heritage buildings if we continue to do things as a business as usual case. In other words, if we don't make any additional investments, what's going to happen to the heritage buildings if an earthquake should strike. 
Of course, we know that earthquakes come in different intensities and that there are different probabilities of earthquakes of different intensities occurring. So we needed to convey to people that, um, for example, for a large earthquake, which has a one in 50 chance of occurring in 50 years time, um, that there would be quite significant damage to the heritage buildings. So about 24 of the 30 buildings would likely be completely destroyed if a large earthquake were to occur. If a moderate earthquake were to occur, it's more likely that that could happen. It's a one in 10 chance in the next 50 years, but fewer buildings would be destroyed. So possibly only about six buildings destroyed in that scenario. And so people are informed about what will happen if an earthquake occurs, how likely the earthquake is to occur. And this is the business as usual case if we don't spend any extra money um, investing in mitigation. For social disruption, we did the same thing, thinking about the length of service outages that might result from a large earthquake, which would be a period of about four weeks, or a moderate earthquake, which would be a period of about one week. And of course, people are informed that if we invest in infrastructure upgrades, we could reduce the number of days of outages. In terms of mental wellbeing, uh, same sort of thing. Um, it's estimated that after a large earthquake event, close to half of the, the town's residents, so about 1,200 people, would likely face a, a mental health challenge of some sort if a large earthquake were to occur, uh, and about 250 people if a moderate earthquake were to occur. And we could invest in better response and recovery plans to try and reduce that, the number of cases. And so all of these sort of status quo figures here have been have come out of um, sort of discussions with Geoscience Australia and other advice from the literature about what would likely happen if an earthquake of varying intensity would occur in York. So back to the choice scenario now. And so what you can see in here are the different attributes, uh, the damage to heritage buildings, uh, the outages to services and the number of mental health challenges. And of course, there is a hypothetical cost to people. We need the cost in there because that's how we understand the trade-off between um, how much people are willing to pay to get improvements in those attributes. And this is proposed as a, a one-off cost to households. We then define an option that is like that opt-out option. It costs nothing. It's a zero dollar option because it's what we're already doing. We're not spending any extra money to achieve this, but if you select the current situation, you end up with the level of damages that we've described already. So the, the 24 um, properties, if it's a large earthquake, for example. But then we propose other options, which do come at some sort of a cost, uh, but propose varying levels of improvements across the options in those attributes. So for example, in terms of the heritage buildings in this particular scenario, you can see that in option two, we get a, a really good improvement through um, investing in a mitigation program where we might see a reduction down to only four buildings being destroyed if there's a large earthquake or one if it's moderate. In option three, we get some improvement. Um, so only 12 are going to be destroyed and three under a moderate scenario. Um, so it sort of sits in the middle. And so across, remember that people see a number of these types of questions and they'll see different arrangements of those different attribute levels in each of the options. And then they have to make that trade off between the cost of the option and the improvements that they get in the option and decide A, whether they can afford it and B, whether it's worth it. So these questions all sit within a, a, an online survey uh, and that survey was conducted uh, late 2020. Uh, we had almost a thousand respondents from the Perth metropolitan region who were provided to us through an online recruitment company uh, and that they target people to give you a representative sample of the Perth population based on um, basic socio-demographics. We also targeted York and surrounding shires uh, and collected 40 responses from that region, partly through the online recruitment panel and also through a flyer distribution that the Shire of York assisted us with. Um, that's obviously a much smaller sample size and I'll, I'll come back to that point um, with results. Now, how do we measure the willingness to pay? I won't show you the statistics that sit behind this because they're a bit tedious. 
but we measured two different forms of willingness to pay. Uh, the first one was a really comprehensive measure um, where we looked at the willingness to pay to avoid damage to a heritage building or to avoid a day of outage of, of services or to avoid an extra mental health case. So willingness to pay to avoid damage to a building, knowing that the risk of damage to that building is dependent on the severity and the frequency of an earthquake event occurring. So this is a really comprehensive measure because it brings into play all of the potential occasions in which buildings could be damaged by an earthquake of any severity, whether it's moderate or large. Um, it also assumes that we can actually protect that particular building if we retrofit it with, with certainty. Obviously, you might have looked at those choice scenarios and gone, that's a really hard question for people to answer. I'll reassure you that we did extensive pilot testing with the construction of our survey. And um, while it, it's hard to explain in a, a brief presentation, in the actual survey instrument, there's a whole lot, there's a whole front end that helps to step people through the process of, of how to approach and answer those questions. So for people taking the survey, it was a lot less confusing than it, it may feel to you right now. Um, but having said that, we acknowledge that this is a very complex choice experiment to compare to the sorts of choice experiments that we would normally do. There's a lot of probabilities to weigh up. And so we're, we're, we're making a big assumption that people could actually interpret the probability of an earthquake occurring, how severe that earthquake might be, and the likelihood of damage to buildings. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a string of events that people need to piece together. So while this is the most comprehensive, we also provided a more conservative estimate of willingness to pay um, that might be more appropriate for use in, uh, for example, benefit cost analyses, um, just as a bit of a safer bet, because we have more certainty that people will have thought about the question um, within the bounds of this interpretation. And that is that the willingness to pay to avoid damage to a building or to avoid an extra outage day or an extra health, mental health case, willingness to pay from a large earthquake event, assuming that that event is certain to occur within the next 50 years. So this is a conservative estimate because it only measures the value of protecting that building under that particular scenario of one large earthquake event happening. Um, it's not, not sort of going into the future, it's not capturing willingness to pay associated with moderate events or any other type of frequency of earthquake. So in terms of the comprehensive willingness to pay results, um, we found that the Perth, Perth households were willing to pay about $195 to protect a heritage building from being destroyed. And the York community um, households in York were willing to pay about an extra $100 on top of that. Perth households were also willing to pay about $65 per um, outage day avoided and your residents about twice that. The Perth households were willing to pay about $2.37 to avoid additional mental health cases. The figure for York, I've got there in brackets and grey text, um, 88 cents. Um, this is where that small sample size comes into play. We weren't actually able to estimate a statistically significant number for um, this particular situation. Uh, likely because of the small sample size. So it's quite a complex analysis that goes into trying to estimate these numbers. And usually you would like a much larger sample to be able to hone in on what the mean willingness to pay is. So I, we can't really be confident that that number is different from zero with the data that we had. But what that probably means is that there might have been some people in the community who didn't really care about mental health, some people who really did, and there was such a diversity of perspectives about that, um, that we can't we don't have enough data to get down to the nitty gritty of what the value is. It doesn't necessarily mean that people in York don't care about the value of avoiding mental health challenges. Another really important point here is that Perth households were, um, some Perth households were not willing to pay anything. So they might have chosen that zero dollar option frequently, or they might have had other reasons for not wanting to participate in, in the choice scenario itself. Um, so that was about 14% of households. That number is really important because if we're going to use this data in something like a benefit cost analysis, then you have to start aggregating these numbers over the number of households that you want to make the assessment for. 
So in that situation, you would want to make sure that 14% of the households you aggregate over have a $0 figure and not $65 or whatever it may be. In terms of the more conservative estimates, you can see these are much smaller because they're not capturing the full value, um, but are still useful pieces of information. So we estimated these for Perth. Um, we're still working on the York ones. Uh, I think, again, there's a sample size issue there, but we'll try and reproduce this, this equivalent set of values for York. So for Perth, um, they're willing to pay about $10 per heritage building saved, uh, about $3 to avoid a day of service outage and 10 cents per mental health challenge avoided. And again, we need to take stock of the fact that 14% of Perth households have $0 willingness to pay. So what does that mean? If you were to think about this in a more aggregate sense, if there's about 800,000 households in Perth, 14% of those aren't willing to pay anything, um, but the rest are willing to pay about $10 each, it means that a heritage building in York is worth about $7 million. So should we mitigate? Um, I haven't personally done the benefit cost analysis of this, um, but Geoscience Australia has certainly been working in that space. And you know, just from a $7 million figure and what I am guesstimating the cost of a retrofitting um, effort is for a building, it's likely to be worthwhile to make that investment. Of course, this is not putting it in the context of whether we should invest in buildings or social disruption or some other natural hazard mitigation. But clearly the heritage buildings are important. Reducing social disruption is also very important. Reducing the mental health impacts was less important, but still valued in, in a relative sense. Uh, we, we're not quite sure um, how that sits with the York community because we just didn't have the sample to estimate it. Another really important point is that we see from this that the Perth community values improving mitigation efforts in York, even though the benefits to them are less direct. Some people might visit York, others don't, but they still value uh, improving our ability to reduce the risk of earthquake to heritage, to the community. Um, and I'd just like to finish on the point to, to round it back around to that comment that economics does more than just think about market-based values. And I think that what we've demonstrated here is that those non-market values are sizable. They're really substantial numbers. People really care about these things uh, when it comes to um, our natural assets, our public assets. They're often the more significant part of the value. Um, and it's really important that we start to think about how we better integrate these into our decision making and making sure they're not left off the table when we do something like the benefit cost analysis. Thanks. Thank you, Abby. Okay, so before I... Before I begin my presentation, I wanted to let you know that we're probably going to be wrapping up the conference a little bit earlier today at about 1.30 p.m. Okay, so let me talk about me for a little bit. <laughs> so I am Georgia Walton. I run a consulting company, The Chimeras Group. Its base focus at the present time is disaster preparedness. So disaster preparedness, we've talked a lot about disasters. Um, we've talked a lot about the what we are guarding against and what we are up against. But um, I want to talk about how we can better prepare ourselves. So disaster preparedness, basically it's actions that you take going forward to mitigate against disaster or protect yourself against disaster. The disasters that we're talking about um, are your natural disasters, your man-made disasters, biological events, technological events. Those two are more are newer and are not as catastrophic to all people, but um, we have seen how the pandemic has impacted heritage and heritage places, tourism, and our own lives uh, quite heavily in the last two years. Technological, we all rely quite heavily on technology. So if it was to change and we have an event that is surrounding technology, all of a sudden 
we are we may be struggling with a big event, a big disaster for our heritage places. <clears throat> so those are the big disasters. We've looked at so many, the last two days we've looked at a lot of the doom and gloom of what we are actually facing. I want to talk about the things that make them worse first. <laughs> And then I will talk about what we can do about it. So you have the disaster or there's a disaster coming and there are escalating factors that can actually make your disaster worse. And disaster preparedness actually can help you to mitigate these factors. So the disaster still happens, but it's not as bad as it could be. These escalating factors are things like fuel loads. They are things that are included in maintenance lists. So is your property, your place, your space maintained? Have you checked your electricals lately? Has your plumbing been checked? Do your gutters need um, to be dealt with? Have you reported that there was a leak in the ceiling last week and to whomever it is who might be able to fix that? If you are not reporting, are not um, checking and maintaining your property, if you are not undertaking mitigation strategies for big disasters, i.e. Uh, fuel, like fuel load reduction or um, you're guttering and tying down and possibly if you can, um, some retrofitting of for cyclone if you need to. If you're not doing that, you have the potential to actually escalate your disaster to something that is far worse than what it would have been. And like I said, I'm going to scare you first and then hopefully bring you back with me and be able to help you to understand that there's a lot that you can do. So the disaster's happened. It's bad. Um, you now have secondary disaster or short, medium and long term impacts following a disaster. Let me give you some examples. So when you have back-to-back back 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 disasters, we've got some examples of that happening over East at the moment, you're actually dealing with the potential issues of not being able to get into your site, not being able to help your site or help the things in your site, not being able to mitigate the potential damage that has already occurred and actually pair that back and you you are basically stuck. You're going to have some things happening. Mold production may happen in flooding. You're going to have possibly an unsecure site. You are going to have your site will be at risk for a, a, a lot of problems that could come your way that do increase your risk of long-term impacts or secondary disasters. That can be loss, that can be damage, that can be just not being able to get to your site and being able to undertake recovery and response procedures. There's also a final disaster I want to talk about, um, spontaneous disasters. It's when everything that can go wrong will go wrong when the proverbial hits the fan, as it were, this is going to happen. Every now and again, you will have had best laid plans. You will have done everything that you possibly can. And all of a sudden, it all just goes to, and you are stuck with a disaster that you couldn't have predicted. You don't know how it happened. And it's actually about what you've put in place before that day that will help you to come forward out of that re and respond out of that in the best way possible. So disasters are inevitable. Disasters are going to happen. We can see that we are up against a big challenge going forward, but there's a lot that we can do about this. And that's why I am here to help you understand that there are things that you can do right now to help you 
and your heritage place, guard against disaster risk. So, risk can be mitigated. So your risks of disasters can be mitigated. And how you do that is very easy. We all used to laugh about those doomsday preppers. And I'm not saying that we're going to go that far, but there are lessons to be learned in being prepared. So what I'm saying is you need to be prepared. You need to start preparing for disaster. Disaster preparedness is generally composed of four parts, preventing, preparing, responding and recovering. What we do is help you to formulate a policy, procedure or plan for all of those four parts. What my company does is that. The first thing that you're going to start with preparedness is assessment. So assessment is basically I see it as the more knowledge you have about your site, about the disasters that potentially might be at risk in your area and your site might be at risk for, and how you might be able to cover and respond to that disaster. The more information you have about that, the better your response and recovery will be and the better your outcomes are. More information mitigates risk. So you need to know your risk. You need to undertake a risk assessment. So you need to understand the context of the risk, identify it, analyze it, evaluate it, treat it and monitor it. You need to, what we always do is we look at every single bit of information that we can. So we look at seismic mappings, mapping and previous events for seismic shifts, so earthquakes. We look at bushfire prone areas, where you sit, where your place sits, how at risk you are, what the fuel load is around your property. We look at floodplain maps. We understand exactly how far you are. We look at past events. We look at predictions for future events and whether you are at risk of water rise. We look at climate change. There's some climate change mapping that has just been released that helps you to understand where you are at risk in areas and what areas are going to be affected by what. So it might be heat, it might be sea level rise, it might be natural disaster, what you are more at risk for. There's mapping for all of that. And what I would suggest as part of your risk assessment, you undertake an investigation into that mapping. The reason Another thing that you should do is look at your past events, your past disaster events for your place itself. If roofs have leaked, if you've had incidents of flooding, if plumbing has been an issue, if your electrics have been an issue, how old is your roof? Understanding the age of your site and the age of the items within your site as well for built heritage. And it's really important. The reason you can do this is you will then understand if there might be a problem coming because your plumbing is degrading or your electrics are not to coat. So it's really important to understand where your risks might be coming from and having that all written down. And then you can go on to evaluating and treating and mitigating that risk. So the next stage I would say is to assess your vulnerabilities and the significance of your site and your items if you do. Understanding what is fragile, understanding what is significant, undertaking what we call, what we have developed is a priority protection list. So understanding and writing down and documenting what is a priority in a disaster that you need to get to first, i.e. in when you are responding to a disaster, you need to get to that item to recover it first or needs to be removed before a disaster occurs. So you've got to know what you have. This might sound ridiculous, 
but what we recommend is that you undertake a full assessment of what it is your heritage place has on site, what it's made up on, what items are in your collections, what they're made up of. It better helps you to understand what issues may arise. Some people still forget that certain types of film can spontaneously combust. I have seen it, it does happen, it can cause damage. Knowing that they need to be isolated, put into protection and possibly even removed off site, digitized and kept off site is really important because you know that that risk, there's an easy way that you can actually mitigate that risk. You have assessed what your process, uh, assessed and processed what your weak points are. The next thing that I would get people to do is undertake maintenance logs and improve their maintenance. Maintenance logs are one of the simplest things that you can do to actually care for your heritage place. So I have logs that start with daily, weekly, monthly, hourly, yearly, and then biannually. You should be reviewing your disaster preparedness plans every year if you possibly can, and also after every single disaster that has occurred. You learn from those events and then you include them in your next plan. You also know what doesn't work and you remove that and put in things that do. Maintenance logs are really important because you know what needs to be fixed, what needs to be attended to before storms, before events, and when things expire. So each year things will expire and you will need to make sure that they are updated. Fire extinguishers need to be done every two years or so, depending on the fire extinguisher. You will need to make sure that your smoke alarm batteries have ch been changed over. They're simple things that are quite common sense. And I want to emphasize Disaster preparedness is common sense. It's just about putting it all together and then putting it into a document that you have and you engage with on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. So maintenance logs. One of the things that I always like to include in maintenance logs are basically going around your site and really taking in what may have changed. So on a daily basis, you would do this anyway, but having it as a process that actually needs to happen means that you're mitigating a risk of an, something not being noticed. So you've walked around the building, there's a weird dark patch on the ceiling. You need to report that, that then needs to be investigated. It's important that we really understand that by maintaining a property, by making sure that we see things, that we document them, that we make um, that we attend to them, we are actually looking after our heritage site. So I've already said that you should review your document, but I'll say it again, your document should be reviewed. I have literally pulled off big, be prepared documents and other like other disaster preparedness plans with inches of dust of them, off of shelves in heritage places. And I've asked them, have, have you ever used this? And they're like, oh no, it's not really practical for us. So this is why I like bespoke disaster preparedness planning because it is practical for you. And also you will have reviewed it multiple times whenever an incident happens. And also a year, every year you will have re reviewed it, which means that you are informing your process, you're proactively managing, what needs to happen, changing what doesn't work and bringing things to a usable document that you're actually going to engage with. So I've said document, I've said documentation, I've said review, they're all buzzwords. Um, the more you document and the more you record, the better opportunity we have of knowing in the future what has been done in the past. This is important for a few reasons. If you can know what has been done, 
you can undo what has been done and or you can build upon what has been done to something bigger or better or more effective. Recording everything in this process, in especially in response and recovery, is very, very, very important because you don't want things going lost in a high stress situation. And I'll get to that in a little bit. You record your processes. You understand what, how you've gotten from A to B, which helps you to get from A to B easily and quicker. Something that I would also suggest is consider undertaking preservation via record. Preservation via record is something that I have found to be very useful for disaster preparedness planning and for total loss scenarios. It is something that I recommend in all of my disaster preparedness plans and whenever I'm working with heritage places about disaster preparedness. Preservation via record is basically undertaking a full comprehensive recording in multiple formats of your heritage place and or your collections within it. Why you would do this is so that you know quite simply what you have lost. In a total loss scenario, i.e. there is nothing left after a disaster, having preservation via record in situ means that you know exactly what it is that you have lost, the entirety of what you've lost, and the importance and significance of what has been taken with that disaster. It may seem like a very morbid thing, but it is your last line of defense in a total loss situation. If we know what we've lost, we are able to interpret that heritage place in a different way because we understand what has gone. If we don't have any information, you will find that we can't do as much as we could if we have images and we have context, we have histories, we have collections, um, 3D imaging if you can do, or just pictures and all of their recorded data. It's really, really helpful. And it's basically the very, very last insurance policy that you have in your pocket for a disaster place. Okay. The next thing that you would do is assess your limitations. Every single heritage site is going to have limitations. We are working in a state of attrition most of the time. It is something that I understand very, very well. Those limitations may be financial or resource based. They may be physical, i.e. you may be a Well, basically, you may not be able to do some of these mitigation strategies because of the physical limitations of your site. It may be too small or there may be too, thing, too many things on it or nothing at all on it. So you have to know what you can do and what you can't do. Uh, you need to make sure that um, you understand that if you don't have that knowledge, there are people that you can reach out to to help you undertake disaster preparedness. There would be a shameless plug that I could put in for my company right here. Uh, but I'm also always happy to communicate with anyone who wishes to talk about disaster preparedness and undertake their own disaster preparedness planning and policy upgrades. You will also have a support network of individuals that you have set up already, whether that be your governing body, the, your financial support, it might be volunteer fire brigade or it may be the police station is next door. You really need to make sure that you have understanding of who you can reach out to in an event. So you've assessed everything you can. How do you use that information? You focus on improving the weakest areas first, the areas where you are already struggling with or can already see gaps. If you do that, you are already going to make an immediate improve, improvement to the risk factors of your site, reducing your fuel load, doing controlled burns, regular inspections of your site, cleaning out your gutters before and after a storm. They all seem 
um, very, very simple, but they are literally going to improve your chance against those risk factors almost immediately. If you write up your maintenance schedules, you're immediately mitigating risk factors. This is also a powerful mitigation tool. Uh, you, once you know what you are weak in or what you are struggling with, you can then immediately reach out and strengthen yourself. Some people may see disaster preparedness as very reminiscent of particular safety conscious people or slogans. We have seen you see the hazard, assess the risk and make the changes. That first part of preparedness is really an assessment is very much that see the hazard, assess the risk, make those changes. The reason it and the reason that we use this in this way is it's solid policy. We we have seen it work and Chimeras Group will we'll rely on solar policy to inform our own policy and inform your policy. Uh, so the disaster's occurred. That's, that's where we're at now. The disaster has happened. Now it's time for you to respond. I'm going to say this very, very clearly. Your safety and the safety of your team, that's the highest priority. Everything else, Hopefully you will have done some mitigation strategies or hopefully you've done preservation fire record. And even if you haven't, everything else is immaterial. Your safety, highest priority. So your initial response, you're going to go through logically, methodically and assess the damage. You're going to document everything. You're gonna document what's occurred. You're gonna document what you're doing. You're gonna document what's happened what's damaged, and with that documentation, you're then going to make a plan of attack. You then go in to the damaged site, and the next thing that you're going to undertake is triage. So Chimeras Group has modelled our triage system on triaging people in a disaster zone, but I'll get to that in just a second. Assessing, documenting, planning and triage may be happening all at the same time, especially if you are a bigger team. If you are a smaller team, it might just be one person. I'm going to give you a little tip. For documentation, the best tool that you can have is actually in your pocket, usually a smartphone. Use that to take photographs, use that to write notes, notate photographs, if you can, you can have that as a body cam as you do work all the way around. You're using a smartphone if you're a small team in a disaster zone is actually just to document what's going on is actually a really powerful tool to know what you've done and what needs to happen. So especially if you're only one person on site or if you are a very small team. So. Let's move towards triage for a second. Chimeras Group, myself, um, discovered that we didn't really have a system of operating for triage. So I thought that the best thing that we could do is model it on a system that's already used, and that is triaging people in disaster zones. So our triage system is color coded. We use one that is quite standard and well known. The categories that we work with to classify items are focused on the risk of loss, married with your significance assessment, a document within your disaster preparedness plan, and your priority protection list, which is also in your disaster preparedness plan. What that means is if an item that is highly significant, it will be assessed first and if damaged will have the highest priority for salvage, stabilisation and conservation if possible. It does not mean your most expensive item will be, unless it is your most significant item. 
significant items may surprise you, but you will have written up your significance assessment, you will know what they are, and you will have a priority protection list that will also know what they are. While triage is occurring, there's going to be others acting on that triaging system. Individuals who will be removing items if they need to be removed, they will be undertaking the, cons the recovery response procedures to ensure that no secondary and tertiary loss occurs to those items or that place, if possible. The reason we do this with one person undertaking the work and one person triaging is so that we are moving as quickly as possible. It's an efficient use of your time and resources for the best possible outcomes and the lowest possible loss. The next thing that you will be doing slash the thing that you will be doing the whole way along is documenting everything. I've said it a thousand times now. Note down everything you do. Um, in a crisis, you will not be thinking clearly. No one will. Um, making decisions on the fly, you want to be able to know what you've done. Uh, so a thing called tertiary loss is a bit of a horror story. <laughs> Basically, in a disaster, you have items moving and being made safe. There are horror stories that I know, incidents of tertiary loss where items have been placed in cars or in safe places. Those safe places have not been noted down. And unfortunately, those items have never been seen again. We will have already, as a part of our disaster preparedness planning, We'll have already stepped out where things need to go, safe options and safe environments for those items to make sure that that doesn't happen again. The last point of things that you can do just now and something that is very important for disaster preparedness is review. Review your systems, review your processes, review your documents over and over and over again. It's going to inform better response times. It will inform a better plan. Everything can be improved upon. Using something once and putting it on a shelf, even though it didn't entirely work, doesn't help you in the long run. So if something doesn't work, make sure that you are reviewing it, changing it, and making it work for you and your site. You're probably thinking I've just thrown a lot of information at you and I have. Sorry for that. But it is, it, disaster preparedness can be as complex as you need it to be. It can be something that is so big and so comprehensive for your huge and big and comprehensive site. It can also be something quite small that you've undertaken with your team that is just clear, concise, and works through everything that you need to know if a disaster was to come to your site. I want you all to know that try not to be overwhelmed. <laughs> it's a lot of information, but there is so much, inf there is a lot more information out there that can help you to start writing your own. And also, there's a lot of information out there where you can start to undertake risk assessment, start to undertake um, your documentation strategies. We, if you are feeling overwhelmed, I can say that please do contact me. I'm happy to discuss disaster preparedness with you. If you are struggling, you don't have to formulate it all yourself. Call in people who know to assist with the logistical load of developing disaster preparedness planning and training. Chimeras Group is one of those people that you can call in. We don't just do the full plan. We have a lot of services to offer. But I will reiterate, you can tailor your disaster preparedness plan to your site. It's the best outcome that you're going to have, and it only needs to be as complex as you need it. So I hope 
that we can help to bridge the gap between knowledge and application, regardless of whether the disconnect is coming from lack of resources, time or knowledge. I can help you with disaster preparedness planning, but there is also a lot of information out there that can help you as well. So that comes to the conclusion of my presentation. And I'd like to help, I'd like to start wrapping up the conference. So the, we have discussed some important and at times very heavy topics over the last, over the past day and a half. But I leave this conference with an optimistic outlook. We have learnt some practical and effective tools to help prepare our heritage places for natural hazards. We, such as considering bushfire risk and including disaster preparation as part of any conservation works and developments. By coming together to explore this important topic, we have demonstrated the great value that private owners, local and state government, agencies, community, community groups, and all those that work in the heritage sector place on Western Australia's cultural her and built heritage. This alone is cause for optimism. I am also glad to see conversations around preparing for natural hazards are now well underway. This event provides us with the opportunity to continue to connect and work together on a topic we are extremely passionate about, the protection of our state's heritage places. I believe this event will provide attendees with future opportunities to connect both virtually and face-to-face, -to, -face, to share knowledge and information around preparing for a natural hazard. All of the presentations have been recorded and will be available to view alongside the PowerPoints on the department's website early next week. I encourage you to take the time to explore those presentations if you are not available to watch them live and even if you were to share them with those you think may benefit from viewing them. As a next step after this conference, the department is looking to build an online resource where presentation documents and guidelines on natural hazard preparedness can be found. As you and your organisation develop new material in this space, there is an opportunity to share it with others in the sector, helping to create a stronger Western Australian heritage sector that is better prepared to face the ever present threat of natural hazards. Thank you so much for joining us. We've come to the end of the conference.